and um, uh, we backed by the uh, Irish Embassy in Vietnam, uh, which is an, uh, a kind of initiative that uh, we try to introduce more about, uh, you know, like fund managers uh, and uh, professionally uh, try to get into uh, the VC industry uh, for this market. So uh, that's why uh, we, we um, uh, can, you know, like glad to have uh, two of our experts here to share more about how we can structure funds. And along this uh, program, we got uh, people from, uh, uh, you know, like uh, Android Investor in Vietnam uh, from uh, VC Fund around this area. Uh, we got um, like uh, uh, NUS and SMU, uh, like university in, uh, in Singapore to, to get involved in this program. Um, okay, so uh, uh, yeah, um, I would like to have some uh, introduction from, from Liam and uh, Anthony first, and then we, we go uh, into, you know, like some uh, concrete uh, topic of today. Thanks, guy. Sure. Thanks, Dean. You, you go Liam, first, I'll, Anthony. I'll, I'll, I was about to say, I'll let you go first. <laughs> okay, great. Well, hi, hi everyone, and uh, thank you all for, for for joining us this evening. And I'm very happy to be to be part of this today. So my name is Lee McHugh. I'm Irish. I'm currently based in Dublin, um, and I head uh, fund administration in Europe for CSC. Um, I, I guess my background, my more recent background is I have been based in Asia for seven years up to last year. I had been based in Singapore, so I would have traveled to, to Vietnam somewhat frequently. Um, and I would have helped Asian managers, you know, whether it's Vietnam, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, in their structure of funds, from both from a fund administration perspective and, you know, from facilitating introductions into the network um, across the various service providers. Okay, um, I'll give a background myself. Um, good, ev good evening, everyone in Asia. So my name's Anthony. Um, I'm the uh, well founder and uh, owner of Inq Global, which is a fund incubation platform, which I set up many, many years ago. Uh, I've known Liam for many years as well. Actually, Liam is the fund administrator to Inq Global when he was in Asia. Uh, but a bit of background on myself. I've been in the funds industry now for 25 years. Over, I actually lived in Asia for the last 25 years as well and just moved to Europe uh, in 2017. Um, prior to this, I was uh, a hedge fund manager or a fund manager and also was involved in fund admin for quite a number of years. But uh, InQ Global is a, is a business which I started many years ago for, as the word is, incubation uh, and InQ for short. Thanks, Anthony. Um, yeah, I think that um, uh, with the, um, uh, the years experience in, uh, in um, uh, Asia, it should be a lot of things that we can share and also uh, discuss today. So um, I, I think that um, uh, about structuring funds, there should be, you know, like uh, as usual, like, like you uh, always mentioned that the, the fund is a fund. Uh, yeah, but uh, it's like, uh, you know, um, these days we, we hope to go through some, some kind of agenda. Uh, the, the first one is that uh, we hope to have um, some sharing from um, uh, Liam in, in terms of um, uh, structure uh, the fund in, in the case of uh, CSC. Uh, we hope that we, we can bring more, you know, like uh, light into this, um, uh, this uh, uh, you know, what happened in the global and uh, belong to what you have done. And uh, then we hope to have um, uh, Anthony in terms of, you know, like more deeply into uh, what kind of options that we have. And uh, after that, we, uh, we will discuss more about the, the questions and uh, some Q and A. Yeah, and also uh, what is the trend, you know, soon uh, in, in this area. Okay, so uh, uh, Liam, please, uh, if you can share the screen, it should be great. Yeah, perfect. Um, I'll share now. Oh, it, it says here that host has disabled screen sharing. So maybe can, can it be shared from your side? Uh, yeah, we have nice. you uh, the the uh, permission now. You you can share now. I think. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah. There we go. There we go. Okay. So you should be able to see this now. Um. So I'll, I'll give a little bit a bit bit more background ourselves at CSC. So CSC, we are um we were founded in 1899. Um, our headquarters is Wilmington, Delaware. So for those of you have, uh, who have exposure or you know, have 
done business in, in America in the past, you know, most US companies, funds, entities would be um, domiciled in Delaware from a from a tax perspective, whether that's a Delaware limited partnership or Delaware LLC. Um, and that's really the, the reason our company was set up. The founders of our company, they wrote the Delaware corporate tax code 120 years ago, and then CSC was set up as a result to facilitate companies coming to Delaware to set up. Um, so today we're still privately held by the, the families of the original founders. I think that's very important as a fund administration company, you know, given we're in the service space, um, I think stability of ownership is, is, is very important. Um, you know, a, a lot of the competition, that, um, a lot of our competitors at the moment would be um, backed by private equity money or, or maybe they might be listed. Um, and, you know, it, it, it presents them with different challenges. You know, they really manage to the next quarter financial period rather than maybe with more of a long-term focus and that can present challenges to the, the clients, the fund managers and their investors. Um, so today um, we, we set up our fund administration business probably about five years ago. So I, I joined initially in Asia um, to set up CSC's Asian uh, business and um, that was 2018, uh, yeah 2018 um, and then in 2020 I relocated to Ireland. So today we have, we're servicing about 400 funds across the globe. Um, the total assets being serviced, assets under administration is probably in excess of 20 billion. You know, we could look at this, we, we service a lot of SPVs for US fund managers. And, you know, it, Anthony can speak more about structuring, but, you know, a lot of US fund managers, when they come into Europe and indeed into Asia, the investments they might make, especially in real estate or, or even in VC, might be through an SPV, a special purpose vehicle. So, you know, we service tons of SPVs. So, you know, if we were to include SPVs into our total figure, that 20 billion figure could be closer to three or 400 billion. Um, today, we have 10 global locations. So in Asia, we have offices in Singapore, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Shanghai. Um, I, I'd love to uh, I, I'd love to go plant a flag for CSC in, in Saigon. Um, you know, if, if the demand is there in due course, it'd be a fantastic place to, to grow our business as well. Um, in, in Europe, we have offices in London, in the UK, in Ireland, in Dublin, where I'm based today, Luxembourg, the Netherlands. And then in the States, we're in Delaware predominantly, but we have offices in each US state. Um, so I think, you know, what, what is fund administration? And, you know, we'll probably, there'll be some crossover here between Anthony and myself and Tien. So I'll go somewhat, uh, high level on this. So really what I would say, you know, what a fund administrator really does is where we service the back office needs of the managers. In addition to that, we would typically be the main point of contact with the investors to the funds. Um, you know, there, there's an, express, an expression in Ireland, children should be seen and not heard. And in many ways, that's somewhat similar for fund administration. You know, if the fund manager, obviously is, you know, their focus is on raising assets and making investments and keeping, you know, and returning strong alpha and strong performance to their investors. Um, if, if, as a fund administrator, if our clients never ring us, that's a great sign that we're doing a good job because what the fund manager doesn't want or need is to be ringing us to check up on, you know, investor reports, excuse me, valuations or, you know, anything like that. So, you know, so as much as possible, we try to stay in the background, but when we are needed, you know, we, we try to facilitate um, our clients and their investors as much as possible. So typically when a fund is set up, you have the fund in, in corporation and formation. So we can facilitate that. Obviously the, the, the law firm would draft the fund documents, but typically it's quite important for the administrator to review those documents to make sure the fee calculations, whether it's a carry or a waterfall or, or a performance fee, whether the wording is correct, we can model out those calculations as well to ensure that what the manager is telling their lawyers is actually being articulated on and reflected on the, on the legal documents. A transfer agency and shareholder services, that really is you know, when investors are subscribing into the funds um, or they're committing capital into the funds, um, you know, we would typically run the anti-money laundering checks on those investors, um, you know, to ensure that there are um, no red flags or no concerns from an AML perspective. We would then have responsibility, you know, with issuing the investors, the capital call statements, subscription redemption statements, you know, depending on the fund structure. So we would be the main point of contact typically with the investors on behalf of the fund. Um, the main, you know, the main part of our job really is the net asset value calculation. 
Um, and that's really, you know, at, at the end of each valuation period, whether it's monthly or quarterly, semi-annual or annual, you know, we would take the, we would uh, create the valuation based on the, um, based on the, the definitions of the valuations in the fund documents, um, the valuation policy. Um, trustee services, depending on the fund structures, there may be a trustee element to that, so the administrator can service that. Consolidated reporting, that could be a fund structure, you know, you could have a VC fund and each investment is held in SPV, so we can consolidate the SPV reporting into the, the fund at a level above that. Audit liaison, this is very important, it's of, often it's, um, it's overlooked, but I think it's, it's one of the most important components of the fund administrator's job. That's really to work with the auditors at year end to ensure the audit is complete, depending on the jurisdictions that the fund is domiciled in, you know, whether it's Cayman, Bermuda, Ireland, Luxembourg, Hong Kong, Singapore, typically you have, you know, maybe anywhere between three and six months at year end to have your audit complete and filed. What you certainly don't want is a, you know, is, is your auditor to, to find issues with your audit. And, you, you know, so the administrator pays a key role in ensuring that process um, meets the deadlines. And then finally, tax assistance, you know, we certainly don't provide tax advice, but you know, with, with the, the, the ongoing creep of um, regulations globally, you know, we've certainly seen things like FATCA, CRS, and, and local taxes becoming more and more uh, prevalent a, across all domiciles and jurisdictions. So we would facilitate, um, you know, the preparation of tax documents for the funds. Um, if there are U.S. investors, we can prepare K-1 or PFIC tax statements. Um, you know, so, so basically there are lots of different components to what we do. Um, if I come to the next slide, but, you know, I, th I think the role of the administrator, while it's the, from a back office perspective, we predominantly are based, I think our role is very collaborative in that, you know, our main point of contact more often than not would be the fund manager. We would also have you know, direct contact with the fund directors. The, the law firm, the, the legal firm, you know, drafting these fund documents, we would work quite closely with, especially at the launch of the fund. Um, typically, fund managers would often come to the administrator with questions before going to legal. And there's a very simple reason for that is we, we don't charge for our, our, advi our advice. The law firms typically will, every time you pick up the phone to them, they'll, you know, they, they charge the fund money. Um, so then depending on the fund structure, there might be a custodian involved if there's equity positions or listed securities. There might be a prime broker involved as well. Um, and, you know, we would um, be a signatory on those accounts or we would have direct access to the accounts and the reports provided by those, um, you know, because we would need that information to prepare the valuations. We would, like I said, we would deal directly with the auditors at year end and throughout the year. Um, depending on the jurisdiction of the fund, we, we would have dealings with the regulators. So, you know, if you look at, you know, jurisdictions like Singapore with MAS or Hong Kong with the SFC, they're probably a bit lighter touch than European jurisdictions like Luxembourg or Ireland, where, you know, the regulatory um, burden is quite high. And then, you know, other jurisdictions like Cayman, Bermuda, BBI, US are probably a bit lighter touch. Um, but there's certainly an element of dealing with the regulators and ensuring, ensuring you know, the various reporting requirements to regulators is met. So what we do, I have this and I can circulate these slides or yeah, you can circulate this, these slides to the attendees afterwards. I won't go into this in much detail. This is a bit more, you know, focused on what it is we actually do. Um, and, I, you know, I think, you know, finally, from my perspective, you know, why people choose CSC, you know, we're very, very focused on, you know, on our clients. Um, servicing them to the to the best of abilities the easiest way to grow a business is to keep your existing clients happy and when they have new business they will give that to you typically um, we are independently owned and we're stable you know so we're, we're not backed by private equity money we're not listed on an exchange you know so our our focus is very much medium to long term which is quite important for us um, we have a very experienced leadership team um, you know so I joined in, in 2018, initially set up the Asian business, now I head the European business. But when I first was coming back to set up the European business, I, you know, I, I got in touch with two former colleagues of mine who I knew were extremely strong to, to, you know, to come on board and, and join the team in Europe. Um, so in all jurisdictions, we got very experienced leaders, which is obviously important um, you know, to be able to give a, a level of comfort to our clients that we know what we're talking about and we know how to help them. 
we have a global platform, you know, so we, we are located in all the key global financial areas, um, like I've already mentioned. And then, you know, our service model is, is quite unique as well. This is probably more European based, um, you know, but we have, it, we have been supported very well in Ireland yeah, by the IDA, the Industrial Development Authority, the, the Industrial Development Authority of Ireland. So because we're an American company, they have supported us with grants to build our regional office in Southern Ireland. It's about an hour from Dublin and, you know, it's given us, it gives us a great advantage over some competitors, you know, in Luxembourg and other jurisdictions where, you know, you know, there could be typically be quite high turnover of staff or the quality of staffing can be quite transient or quite poor. Um, whereas in, in Ireland, you know, our, Ireland as a country has been servicing funds probably for 25 years now. So we have, you know, we have a lot of um, highly talented people. A lot of the universities in Ireland now have fund administration programs, certificates, diplomas, you know, so it, it, it means that there are good quality people coming out to work in the space. And then I think the final point I have up here is sectoral expertise. Um, you know, so we, we, we have a focus on institutional clients with a particular emphasis on credit funds and private equity real estate strategies. And, you know, but I, I think if you look at funds, I would typically bucket funds as being open-ended or closed-ended. So open-ended funds are those that allow investors to come in quite frequently, you know, daily, weekly, monthly, um, and typically open-ended funds would be hedge funds, you know, where the, the investments made by the manager would be liquid. Um, and then closed-ended funds typically would be private equity, real estate, VC, you know, where the underlying investments are, um, you know, they're illiquid assets, illiquid investments. So, you know, you don't want to, you know, you're not in a position if an investor says, hey, I need to liquidate or I need to redeem my money tomorrow. You, you wouldn't be in a position to, to facilitate that because you, your underlying investment, you know, might take two, three, four or five years to, to be monetized or realized. Um, you know, so we service clients across hedge funds, private equity funds, real estate, VC, um, credit, debt. And, you know, I, I think later in this conversation, we can probably start talking about trends because um, it, it's changing. But, um, you know, we're, we have the technology and the skill set to service all types of funds um, and, and all types of sizes as well. Um, so I think um, I think the last thing I have here is just a map of where we actually are. Um, but I, I think I can I can finish up there and let Anthony now cover his slides. Yeah, no, thank you, Liam. Um, right, let me throw up my slides. Bear with me. Sorry, I'm trying to find short windows. There we go. Sure. Okay. So hopefully can, everyone can see this. Um, so I'm going to take it from a different perspective um, to Liam. Even though I've worked in admin, I've actually worked as a fund manager myself. So let me, it's a very relatively straightforward um, diagram here. But one thing I want to highlight here, um, especially the, the blue with the red dot or red uh, hub in the middle, I'll call it, is exactly what Liam said. The admin is a critical part. Having worked in, you know, worked around my own fund and worked on other funds as well, the fund admin is a critical component with working with all the other service providers. That includes legal, auditor, custodian, prime broker. Uh, one thing that's also, which is not in the hub, but it's the two here, is they do work with the investors and they work with the investment manager. So something that, that Liam brought up is, I think the critical part when setting up your fund is selecting the right fund admin to work with because client services is one of the biggest things um, that your investors will rely on, and you also as a fund manager. Now, I, can, I won't name names, but I was actually in a board meeting this morning uh, where the fund is using a very, very big uh, fund admin by brand name. Uh, however, its service has never been great. And actually, if anything, it's got worse. And in the discussion, the board meeting is to find a new fund admin that will service the clients 
much better and will actually make the investors happy because at the moment we're even getting complaints from the investors. Um, so critical part here is the fund admin. Now, Tian, you mentioned, and I always use the word when setting up a fund, a fund is a fund, okay? It is just a structure, it's a legal entity and it's where you decide to set it. Now, one of the key questions when you go set up a fund is, and what decides which jurisdiction you select a fund in, is where are your investors from, okay? Now, Liam had touched on quite a few things there. Delaware in particular, obviously is, um, is the kind of the point where US investors invest into. And then we're talking here now about Ireland as well. So Ireland is the gateway for European investors, especially from AIFMD. AIFMD is the regulation in the EU, the Alternative Fund Managers Directive, which has um, regulations in particular that EU funds need to be set up to be able to market to EU investors, okay? And the rest of the world, if you look at Asia in particular or UK, um, they tend to go more towards the offshore route, which in this case is Cayman and Bermuda. Um, there is also BVI. So when structuring a fund, the first question is always asked, where are your investors from? Then the other part that you need to look at is what are your investments? Now, this discussion is about VC and in particular Vietnam. Um, so, you know, and we talked about, uh, Liam talked about special purpose vehicle or SPVs and tax. Now, typically a fund in Ireland, Cayman or Bermuda, if there's no tax treaty in terms of your investment, what you would typically do as a fund manager is set up an SPV for that investment, okay? Um, now, the good thing about Vietnam, it's, it's relatively a straightforward investment into Vietnam from any jurisdiction. However, again, looking at different jurisdictions like say China, for example, if you were going to invest into China and you wanted to have a tax benefit where you can reduce your withholding tax as a foreign investor, you would use an SPV domiciled in Hong Kong because they have a double taxation agreement. But in the case of Vietnam, it's relatively straightforward. And the same thing goes for Singapore and Hong Kong. Okay. So we now talked about fund domicile, the, the criticalness of selecting the right fund admin, and then obviously now working with your different service providers, like I said, your lawyers, legal, your auditors, custodian, if you were trading listed securities, banks for bank accounts for, for investors to subscribe and redeem from. Uh, and obviously operating accounts, CorpSec and register office, which is usually linked to legal. Uh, this is where they provide things like minutes of meeting, preparing agendas for meetings, preparing board minutes and things like that. And then again, if you're trading listed securities, which I've just thrown in here, but it's broker prime broker. But if you're doing a venture capital uh, or a VC or a PE fund, then typically you wouldn't have a, a broker or prime broker. You probably would work with them, in terms of having um, obviously introductions to companies that may look at raising capital or even potential pre-IPO, okay? So that's the fund structure. What are the types of funds? And Liam has touched on this already. Um, I'll start off with Europe. I know it's at the bottom here. Um, typically in Ireland, and, and Liam, please do step in when if you want to. There's, there's two types of funds um, in particular. One is a USITS. Okay, which is a uh, undertaking for the collective investment of in transfer of securities, which in essence we call retail funds. Okay, there are investment restrictions on USITS fund structures. So it's not a, a, a structure where you can just put any type of investment in there. There are actually restrictions. Um, and the second type of fund that's available is what we call the alternative investment fund. So it doesn't have the restrictions of a USITS, but it is obviously identified for qualified investors, but it doesn't have the investment restrictions that a USITS has. Uh, Liam, do you want to kind of step in and just, if you want to add to that? I, I, I think you captured it very well, Anthony. I think, um, you know, the probably USITS funds are typically more suited to be hedge funds or open-ended whereas the you know an apes and icabs would be more closed-ended certain the certainly the regulatory burden on usits would be quite higher than 
AVES or ICAVs and the, the dealing frequency, I, I think the typically they'd be daily um, and probably the most illiquid you can have is uh, every two weeks evaluation, you know, whereas an AV or an ICAV could be monthly, quarterly, semi-annual. Now, and that's true. And the new thing that's come out is limited partnership, investment limited partnership structures, which is now available in the EU, um, which is taken up quite a lot by, by new fund managers. Now in Cayman, we have a comparative analysis over on the offshore side. So Liam mentioned about open-ended and closed-ended. Typically open-ended funds uh, are used for liquid assets. So things like trading futures, options, equities, bonds, where investors can subscribe and redeem from a fund, uh, you know, whether it be a monthly or daily, weekly, monthly, or even quarterly perspective. And where closed-ended funds are slightly different, where investors can subscribe, but their redemption won't be allowed unless approved by the manager. So it is closed for redemption and typically used by private equity or venture capital funds. But not so much compared to a limited part. Limited partnerships are more really designed for the really liquid assets, as I said, BCPE. Slightly different where the investors that come into the fund are actually called partner, limited partners themselves, but the structure is called limited partnership. And there is a general partner associated with it. Now, one of the benefits of the limited partnership, especially from a PEVC side, um, is that the investors actually hold the underlying assets of the actual partnership. Whereas with a exempted limited liability company, they own shares in the company opposed to the actual assets of uh, the underlying. So in a case of where VCP, which is something I always touch on with, with managers that trade VCP is that you've got to think of your exit strategy. You know, you have to have a timeline, you know, are you going to exit within five to 10 years and what's your exit strategy? So if you're saying that within five years, hopefully the VC or PE investment you do is going to be a listing, that's great. Once it lists, then hopefully you'll be able to liquidate your positions on, a, on an open market. However, if that listing doesn't happen, then what's your fallback? So typically in a private equity firm or, or, or VC firm is they'll usually have an option to extend the, the time period. So if they say it's five years, but they have the option to add one or two or three extra years, and it could be just the market sentiment's not great so that the IPO is being delayed. But if that IPO still doesn't happen, or if there's no trade deal with, a, with another buyer, then typically there's what we call redemptions in kind, um, where the investors will get redeemed on, but they will end up holding the underlying assets that they hold in the partnership. So that's one of the advantages of using a partnership structure. Um, and again, slightly different where in a, a company, you're owning shares of the company. In a partnership, you're using capital accounts where it's actually a dollar value. Okay. Um, Liam, do you want to add to that as from an fund admin perspective? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think you know from the limited partnership, the way I would see it, in addition to that, Anthony, is that it's the limited partnership is the structure that U.S. investors are most comfortable with. So typically, when U.S. investors or U.S. managers come to Europe via fund, it will be through a partnership. Um, you know, so I think for for anyone on this uh, call today that is considering setting up a fund structure that may have US investors, I think a partnership is always a very good option to have for them. Okay, so this is the types of funds we just discussed now. Now, key documentation. When you go out setting up your funds, so if you're starting from scratch, okay, typically you'll go to the, your admin to start with or a law firm, okay? And your admin will work with law firms, uh, whether it be Cayman, Bermuda, Ireland, they're domiciled in those locations. Those law firms will design basically the private placement memorandum or PPM, or in another word we use is offering document, okay? Which describes basically everything from your investment strategy, investment restrictions, the terms and conditions of your fund, like your management fee, uh, performance fee, or what we call carry. Uh, it'll, it'll describe um, things like risk, uh, uh, risk details about the fund, the risk factors, 
so it's basically a lengthy document which investors use to to understand your your fund but that will complement uh in terms of what the the second part which is the fund marketing the second part of the other documents that the lawyers create is your subscription redemption documents okay so that's when an investor decides right i want to invest in this fund i li- i understand it i want to go into it they fill in a document and then they included with that document is things like which Liam touched on was FACA and CRS for tax purposes. Um, and which FACA, FACA is using W8 forms from the IRS. Okay. Now you as a fund manager, if you do launch a fund to be able to manage that fund, you're going to have to have agreements in place between the fund and yourself because the fund in itself is not actually where you're employed you're actually employed as the investment manager or appointed as the investment manager. So part of the, what the lawyers will prepare is the investment management agreement. And if you have an advisor, it would be an investment advisor agreement. And these agreements are in place that allows you to then manage the fund's assets, okay? There are other agreements with the fund, things like the fund administration agreement or a uh, custodial agreement, um, which again, will you'll get Give, be given that by your service providers. Okay. Now, one thing that's not in here, which I haven't put in, but with a partnership, it's a little bit different. With a partnership, there's one document that you have to add in, which is the LPA, the limited partnership agreement. Because as I mentioned, in a, in a traditional fund where it's a limited liability company, you're getting shares in the fund, but in a partnership, it's a partnership. So part of that is an agreement to say that you form that partnership or you become a limited partner of that partnership. And a lot of the terms in the partnership agreement does also re- replicate from what the PPM or the offering document has, okay? Now, once you get your fund up and running and you have all your service providers all in place, now you're out ready to, to go raise assets and to be able to then manage your fund. So part of the, the key things that you have to have is obviously your presentation. Then once the fund is up and running, you're gonna have fact sheets. Fact sheet is like a monthly, it's like a newsletter where you give updates on the performance, how things are performing in the fund, how the investments are going in the fund, okay? So this is something that you prepare for for the for prospective and existing investors. Then the, 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 the critical part, which an investor will require when you actually start rate, looking at raising capital from investors is a due diligence questionnaire. Now. One thing I'll say is there, you need to spend a lot of time on this and it is a lengthy document. But in essence, it's a document about how the fund, the manager and or the advisors operate and who are the key personnel. It's it's almost taking parts of the PPM and highlighting them in a shorter document where an investor can quickly review the DDQ and reference it back to the PPM. But it also just doesn't cover that. It covers a a lot more documentation than the PPM. As I said, it looks at the stuff on the manager as well or the advisor. Okay, so a lot of emphasis needs to be placed on this. Because if you pass the DDQ, then typically an investor will do what we call a quantitative and a qualitative due diligence. And that is where they actually visit you to make sure to see that you are a fund manager. The, the term that we use in the industry is that you're not just a blue, uh, a man with one blue and a Bloomberg terminal. They want to see that you're actually a business operating with proper controls, governance, compliance, and risk management. Okay. Now, when this is all formed, typically the lawyers will prepare the following documents for you. It's a certificate of incorporation for a limited company. In a partnership, you'll have a partnership certificate. You'll have the company constitutional documents, which we call a memorandum article of association, or in some cases called an article of association. You'll have a certificate incumbency, which d- d- shows who the directors of the, of the company are or the fund and who the beneficial shareholder of the fund is. Certificate of good standing is, again, it's issued once a year, but it's typically, but you can request it at any time, but it just shows that the company is actually in good standing with the registrar of companies, okay? so that it's not insolvent, that it's paid its bills, that it's actually running correctly and it's done its audit. Uh, The next part is the register of directors and officers. So the fund in itself or the company as a fund will have a board of directors, which which should have independent directors. 
uh, that would act in the interest of the investors of the part or investors of the fund. The officers are things like the corporate secretary. And then the register of members, as I said, it's, it's more the beneficial owners or the, the people that own the management shares or the common shares of the, of the company. In a partnership, as I mentioned, it's a little bit different. It's not incorporated. So it's a partnership agreement and the partnership agreements form a partnership. Okay, it's not a legal entity in itself. Um, Liam, is there anything is there anything that you would like to add to this? No, I think that's fantastic, and I, I think a key point you made there that's worth reiterating is that you know the one man in a Bloomberg analogy um, or description. You know, I think regulators in all jurisdictions are looking more and more for substance, and you know, and just signs of substance. Yeah. For, from investment managers. So I think that's a key point too. Um, and and there's, there are good solutions for all jurisdictions there as well. Yep, okay, no, thank you. And that's true. So, you know, one, one thing I do is when I've set up businesses or even investment managers or work with investment managers that I that I decide to launch and I join as a director. One thing I do emphasize with them is having that substance. And when I say substance, it's not, as I said, the, the, we always use the term of, of one man in a Bloomberg. No, it's having proper policies and procedures. It's having um, compliance. It's having proper AML policy procedures, having proper systems, business continuity plans, disaster recovery. It's a lot of documents and it's, I know it sounds overwhelming, but these are documents that a regulator requires when you run a, a licensed investment manager. Um, and obviously, it's also what a, an investor would look for to know that the, that the manager has all this in place. Because one, one of the things that always gets missed out on is about key man risk. Because let's say you are a one man in a Bloomberg terminal. What happens if you as the key man gets hit by a bus? What happens to the assets in the fund? Can it be liquidated? Can the investors get their money back? So these are the things that you need to consider uh, you know, as part of your business continuity, you've got to have key man clauses in your offering documents. You know, what happens if something does unfortunately happen to the man, to the key man, there must be a backup or a, a, um, a redundancy in case that does happen. Okay. Now, going back to, you know, these, we've talked about the fund structuring, the domicile, the fund admin, the criticality, and again, one of the things I always say is, yes, once you start going about going set up a fund, you always go see the, um, the lawyer to start with. Again, like the admin, the, you know, it is critical in selecting the right lawyer and also going to see the lawyer with at least some knowledge. One of the things I advise potential fund managers is don't go to a lawyer without any knowledge of how to set up a fund or manage a fund. Always have something learn before going to them, understand the different structures, understand the requirements, understand what documents are required. And again, a good source of information for this is your fund admin. As I mentioned in my picture earlier, they are the cog, in the hub in the wheel. They work with all these service providers and they're a good source of information, uh, especially when you wanna successfully run a fund. That's where I'll, I'll stop there, Tien. <laughs> yeah, thanks, uh, Anthony. I think that, uh, yeah, we, we, um, we got a very um, uh, detailed slide from uh, both of you. And uh, for now, I think uh, we, we get more of info in you uh, to know, like uh, we, we dive deep more into um, the situation and uh, also some, some train, okay? So um, uh, these days, uh, we have um, uh, see more, you know, like innovative way in, uh, you know, create and structure funds and also like uh, in regulation. So one, one thing that I would like to discuss, which is a uh, kind of popular these uh, year in, uh, uh, for example, uh, Singapore and Ireland, what we call the variable um, um, capital company. Yeah, the VCC. Okay, so VCC, uh, correct. Yeah, and anything uh, advanced about that? Why people just you know discussing those things? Uh, well, I, I can quickly start off, and obviously Liam's also from Singapore, and I've I've lived in Singapore. Look, I, I I do think the VCC is a valid fund product. Okay, it's taken parts of Cayman and it's taken parts of 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 the EU in terms of how it's structured. 
Um, now, with any fund, especially a new fund structure, in this case, the VCC was really launched at the beginning of 2020. It's, it's known in Asia and it's heavily marketed in Asia. But one of the unfortunate, you know, it's not unfortunate, it's just a, a timing thing, is that when you start marketing to investors outside Asia and you say, hey guys, I've got a VCC, they're gonna have to go, well, what's a VCC? We're accustomed to an Irish fund, we're accustomed to a Cayman fund, but what's a VCC? We know Singapore, but we've never, we've never heard of it. We've never seen, because it is a relatively new structure. Saying that, give it a few more years, once everyone understands it, it'll be a, you know, a streamlined product, just like, like an EU fund or, or, or Cayman fund. But in the initial onsets, you will get a little, uh, quite a few more questions from more European and US investors who are, as I said, more comfortable and more accustomed to the funds in their domicile. Liam? Yeah, I, it's it, the VCC is an interesting one. I think having having had the pleasure of of living in, in Singapore for so long, you know, it always blew me away at how Singapore Inc has grown. You know, since it was 1965 or you know 60, 57 years ago, and um, when it was when it first became a country. Um, and Singapore has been fantastic at spotting trends, identifying you know. In, across various industries and sectors globally, what works, what doesn't, you know, where the trends are going, and then copying them, and except more often than not doing a better job. Um, I think the, the challenge with the, uh, so on the plus side, the VCC, we, we've seen a huge number of them um, being incorporated, you know, since January 2020. Um, one of the big advantages is that there were significant grants towards the legal costs being provided, I think, for the first two years. So that certainly helps. Um, but like like Anthony said, I think brand recognition is, is, is the challenge here. And ultimately, you know, if, if I was going to launch a fund tomorrow, and I'm sure Anthony has seen this many times, you know, you can have a, a fund manager or, you know, someone with a really good strategy and a good plan and, you know, a good track record. Um, and, you know, whether she or he wants to choose VCC or Cayman or Ireland or Lux, really in many cases, the decision ultimately is with their investors because if they have, have a seed investor that's going to give them a subscription of five, 10, 15, 20 million dollars, and that person says, I'd like this to be a Bermudan fund or I'd like this to be an Irish fund, you're going to do it. You know, as long as there's, you know, the, the tax treaties are in place, there's no tax leakage, you know, it's it's very hard, you know, to to um opt for another structure there. But but certainly going back to the VCC, you know, it, it's it's only going to gain traction. You know, I think if, if you, you look at the fund structuring timeline in recent years, you know, if we were having this conversation 15 to 20 years ago, probably the most common global fund structure would have been Bermudan. And then quite, you know, quite dramatically, we saw Cayman overtake Bermuda um, probably 10 years ago, and, you know, and what we would have seen, traditionally seen 10 years ago would be Cayman standalone funds. Um, but now, especially in Asia, like it came in SPC structure is very, very popular. The segregated portfolio structure, that's an umbrella structure. Um, and that, that gives great speed to market. Now, Bermuda, Bermuda came straight back with the Bermudan SAC structure. I think it's the SAC, Anthony, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. It's the SAC. It's just the middle yeah. acronym. <laughs> yes, yeah, segregated account company. And then like Mauritius, for argument's sake, did the PCC, their, their version of the, the portfolio co uh, company, but their version of an umbrella structure. So, you know, I think, I think Singapore is going to have its place. The VCC will have its place. And it's about brand recognition for the, for the investors into those funds. Ultimately, um, what you probably see is, you know, you might see managers in Asia, in Asia start off with the VCC as their assets grow and as they get exposure to a larger potential investor base, it might be conversations with potential investors that might trigger them to choose Cayman, Ireland, Lux, Bermuda for fund two or fund three to get access to the, the larger or the more institutional non-Asian investors. Yeah, okay, I, I see. It's, um, uh, it's maybe something that we, we can um, have a look and, you know, keep an eye on that in, in the near yeah. future, uh, especially, you know, it's a, a new thing uh, that happened around. Uh, what, one more topic that we can discuss, which is um, uh, also related to this group, which is um, the rising of uh, angel investment. 
So it's like uh, nowadays in, in Vietnam, the more and more entrepreneurs, you know, gain some uh, capital and now they, they like to, you know, invest as in business angels. And um, uh, we got some, uh, some, some organization. Uh, for example, I take out the uh, Halo Business Angel Network in uh, Ireland, for example, uh, fund by some um, uh, government um, uh, initiatives and uh, they gather the angels and they, you know, do pitching and a lot of things to, to have, you know, enjoy invest and uh, uh, from, from their money, right? So um, uh, if uh, an organization like that, you know, just um, operate and we compare to the uh, effectiveness of a fund, you know, I believe that they somehow, like, for example, if we hold a group of angels like that in Vietnam, we may, you know, get involved in some uh, intention to do some fun. So what is your, your suggestion then? If we just keep our money, you know, in, in our pocket individually uh, and co-invest together, or we can form a fund together as an angel. So what do you uh, suggest or pros and cons or anything? Um, I'll, I'll quickly start to that. I, I guess the question is, one of the things is, you know, when you say angel investors, how big are you know how much are you actually going to raise and and how are you going to invest if you're going to do it you know if you're if you're looking at investing in multiple companies mm. okay not just one then you know you do you want each investor to subscribe to each company individually or do you pull the investors together and let the fund as a single entity invest in multiple companies that's where then the fund is the, obviously the, the, the simpler version because you're kind of, as I said, collective investment scheme, pulling the angel investors together and mm -hmm. then having a manager in place that's identifying each of the companies that you want to allocate to. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, um, you know, you're not having to coordinate too much work with each of the angel investors by saying, okay, we have 10 companies, you know, 10, you know let's say you have 50 angel investors they're going to subscribe times 10 times, you know, times 50. That's a lot of work. Whereas mm -hmm. in a fund, you just have the 50 angel investors going into the fund, subscribing into the fund. And then that fund in itself, then allocating to 10 of those companies as a single entity. So there's a lot of ease of use of using a fund. I see. But uh, from, from the perspective of an angel, for example, um, mostly they invest in um, high growth startup. And they got yep. different criteria in terms of uh, the risk, how, how to make the, the risk smaller. So um, uh, in, in the case of the group of angel, they got the, uh, they can be design by themselves. Uh, but Correct. with the fund, you know, they, they need to follow on. So it also depends. That's exactly right. And, mm -hmm. you know, a fund is that they have the same, as I said, looking at the PPM, this, mm -hmm. they understand the risk of the, of the fund and its allocations or its investments. And those risks across the board are the same and mm. in terms of the process. So they, they have to work together to mm. understand. Now saying that, like, like you said, some invest, angel investors might say, well, it's not, you know, I have my view on this type of company. Mm. Look, it, it, you could do it in a different way. You could say, well, you know, and I'm just putting it from this perspective. Let's say that angel investor has $10 million. Mm. Okay. They might allocate 50% on their own investment and then 50% into the fund as mm. a collective. Mm -hmm. So there, there's, you know, you don't have to put 100% in. You can certainly put a percentage of your AUM by having mm. access. And look, the other thing too to consider, the underlying companies, mm. would they prefer to deal with, you know, a group of angel investors individually mm. or would they just prefer to have one legal entity to work with? Mm. So these are the things that to consider. I see. I see. Um, Anything you want to add? Yeah, yeah to add? I like. No, I think Anthony's captured things very well there. Um, I, we lose him, I think. Um, yep, we've dropped out a little bit there. Like, can you hear me? Yep, can hear you now. You're back uh, yeah, on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. My, my, my apologies. Um, you know, uh, two points I'd like to make, um, but I think Anthony has captured everything very well. Um, the first is within a fund structure, typically we have uh, what we call a, a TER, a total expense ratio. Um, you know, and what you want is that ratio to be as small a percentage as possible of the total value of the fund. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, like for argument's sake, if someone contacted me and say, look, you know, we're thinking of starting a fund, we have a million dollars. 
let's face it, a million dollars is a lot of money, but in a in the case of a fund, it's not a lot of money because your annual running costs might be, you know, 75 to 150,000, you know, so, you know, um, there's certainly that factor, you know, so I think when you look at these kind of club deals or, you know, angel investor deals, potentially when you get to a certain size, then, you know, there's a good justification to, to pivot into a fund structure, to, you know, to, to best maximize um, the additional uh, capabilities and services that would be available to you. And I, I think if, if I think back to t- late 2017, I'd say when Bitcoin first started to, you know, go crazy, um, I had so many interesting conversations with really smart people um, that would have been outside of the fund sphere, you know, typical fund managers, you know, they might be a scientist or engineer, you know, like al- algo traders or, you know, I would have got to know the type of manager, but the, the crypto people, I, I'd never really come across these kinds of mindsets where you had really incredibly smart people doing incredibly interesting things um, with cryptocurrencies and making, you know, making a lot of money. And all of a sudden, once Bitcoin went crazy, you know, what initially had been, you know, a, a deal between a group of investors, you know, that might have been 50,000 or 500,000 was now 5 million, 20 million, 50 million. And they were very much looking, you know, it's time for us to get, you know, to properly structure our investments within a fund structure where we can benefit from a tax perspective. We can benefit from the comfort of the services provided from the specialists, such as lawyers, administrators, custodians. Um, and it's probably no different to the, you know, the points that you're suggesting, Tina, is there's probably a threshold under which there's, it probably wouldn't make commercial sense to go into a fund structure. But I think once you get close to that threshold, or if you think you might be able to attract larger investors in, um, typically the larger investors, A, would want a fund structure, and B, they'd probably want to dictate the jurisdiction of that fund. Um, and, you know, and in many cases, they'd probably want to take a cut of the investment management um, company as well. That's probably a, a different conversation. I see. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, uh, in um, the VC world where we operate, uh, there will be some uh, other concept, which is uh, the CVC, the current uh, venture capital. So at first they can start like, you know, like they, they got the fund from the corporate and now they want to invest in VC. So that's why they, you know, get in uh, that fund and also operate. Uh, but uh, and what I believe is that uh, they're not really a fund yet until they gather, you know, like third party investment. Uh, what do you think about, about that things? And is there any cases that you see like that corporate uh, run a VC? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll quickly start. Yeah, look, I always get a lot of questions about, well, what's the difference between a corporate standalone company versus a fund? Look, at the end of the day, you can use a corporate entity, but the problem is it doesn't have the controls, the risk processes. It doesn't have what we call independence, okay? I still remember in the early days when I was in Shanghai, this was 2007, and I used to go to to, um, PE firms selling fund admin, and they always said to me, oh, what are you talking about? Fund, you know, private equity funds don't use fund admin. Um, And that that was true in those days. But if you look now, most private equity firms have to use fund admin. It's not even a, it's not even a a choice. You have to do it because unfortunately what caught on very quickly after that was when they didn't have that independence, okay, as a, just as a corporate, the manager, which is unfortunate, was not properly valuing the underlying investment correctly, okay? Okay. So they were saying, oh, the value of this company is $20, but really it was only $10, okay, per share. And they only showed the $10 per share when a person decided that they wanted to exit the fund. So there was no independence, independent of valuation, independent of checking what the manager is actually doing, you know, are they valuing the underlying investment correctly? Okay, there has to be some sort of checks and balances. And as I said, in this day and age, 
a PE fund or a VC fund without an admin that's checking the manager is a, is a no-no. And, and Liam, you can probably touch on that too. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think you, <laughs> I, I fully agree. Um, you know, I, I think it boils down to, and certainly independence. Independence is obviously vital. And I think as the regulators get more involved, um, outsourcing key services becomes more important. And depending on the jurisdiction you're in, um, the um, regulation of the service providers becomes important. You know, so today in Singapore, Hong Kong, America, fund administrators are not regulated. Um, whereas in Ireland, Luxembourg, uh, came in Bermuda, they are quite heavily. Um, and you know, that regulation should give comfort to the managers. I think ultimately though, in, in many ways, if, you know, whether it's a corporate or a fund, if a manager is doing well, you know, if, if they're very successful with their investment strategy, if they have lots of investors, the value of the investments are going up. If they have more potential investors looking to join the fund, you know, the investment manager and his or her team are going to be busy. And, you know, what do they want to do? They want to focus on making more investments, raising more capital, bringing in the investors and just pushing the other services to the side to specialists who can, in, in most cases, focus on providing those services more cost effectively and to a higher standard. And then ultimately that lets the manager have more time to do what they want to do, which is, you know, make investments and raise more assets. And that goes that goes to the to the that that diagram that I showed earlier mm. about that hub, and that's why I have the manager separate, mm. because that hub is the bit that the manager works with, to make sure that everything is running smoothly and that they're not inundated with operational procedures in managing a fund, or 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 company. Because like I said, the the fund is a corporate entity anyway. You're just appointing service providers to run the operations of that corporate entity in a, in, as a fund structure. And along with that structure, I believe that the, the cost is quite high. So that may be a kind of a reason why, you know, people can start with the holdings or whatever uh, corporate. And we got some number, which is uh, like the active VC that uh, operates in Vietnam for now is like 110. Uh, yeah, it's kind of, uh, you know, like uh, for, for this uh, size, it could be, you know, like um, more funds that jump into this area, which is uh, like, uh, and they are v a VC. Uh, the fact is that there's some uh, fund managers in terms of the VC would um, tell me that, okay, they uh, they first time manager, right? So they rather start uh, a holdings company. They rather raise from, you know, like, uh, rich people, um, uh, high net worth people, and many to put in, buy some equity in the holdings company, and then they can run to uh, to invest. Not like the structure of the fund. So, what do you think about that? Uh, that ideas. Again, in, in a corporate entity, and this is from a structural perspective, when your investors invest into that fund, okay, they're owning what we call common shares or voting shares, okay where in a fund they're participating or what we call preferential shares. So if they commingle in a corporate entity and let's say there is a, a uh, dispute because they don't believe in what the manager that's running that corporate entity is right, they can actually vote that person off because, and typically you'll find that it's the directors that manage the company, okay? So if an investor in a normal holding company goes, well, you know what? These directors are doing an awful job. They're not doing, making the right investments. We don't, you know, we're not getting involved or we're not having our say. They have the right to actually vote you out as a director. So that's one of the, which I always tell potential fund managers, yes, you can do that, but you, get, you, you give the right to the investors to manage, to control the company, okay? Where in a fund, they're participating, okay? So they own preferential shares. So it's not them that's voting, it's the manager, but what it allows them to do is to be able to redeem from the fund, okay? So they can put in a redemption. If they feel that, hey, this manager's not doing a great job, I wanna redeem, then they can redeem from the fund. Uh, Liam, do you wanna? Yeah, like I, 
I think it, it's it, it, there's probably an evolution to to this as well, Tian, where you know depending on size and scale, you know it makes most sense to start start off in a corporate, but as you grow, as you evolve, then and the assets that you're managing grow, then you know the argument for looking at a fund structure becomes greater. You know, I think it boils down to you know you need to be able to walk before you can run, um, and by all means, you know in that corporate structure you can, you know prove your concept out and, and build performance. Um, but, you know, tip, you know in, in many cases, you know, when assets get to a certain size, it makes most sense, you know, to, to pivot into a fund structure. Yep. And, and you know, just to, get, to give real life example, if, if the corporate structure was the structure or holding up was a structure, why aren't the big shops like KKR or Bain or those firms just doing it that way. They are doing it as proper fund structures with proper controls, with proper yeah. independence. Otherwise, everyone just be doing corporate structures all the way through. But obviously, they don't. Exactly, exactly. And uh, what I believe is that uh, people just come from uh, what they are confident with. Uh, you know, they're confident with um, cooperation and, you know, the control and the stuff of uh, things like that with the uh, fund uh, structure. Uh, yeah, the structure of fund is uh, quite new to them. So somehow they can choose that way. Uh, I, I got three more questions be before we can, you know, like get involved our audiences. Uh, the first one is that um, uh, for, for Anthony, what do you think in terms of uh, the, the fund um, uh, word in Vietnam? Uh, yeah, the ecosystem of fund in Vietnam through the time that you work here. And yeah. what, what do you think about that? Well, as uh, most of the funds that you see in Vietnam, um, or uh, what I was to say is if you look at investors, foreign investors in particular, investing into Vietnam, whether it be listed equity or VC or private equity, with the likes of, say, Dragon Capital, who I know Don Shriven, uh, Don Lam at Vietcap, um, or Vina Cap, I should say, sorry, um, Indoshine Capital, all these firms have got, in particular, Cayman funds investing into Vietnam. And as I said, that can be either private equity or let's call it illiquid investments, or even listed investments, okay? Um, because that's where they raise their money from and that's how they grow their AUM from foreign investors, but not just foreign investors, but also local investors, okay? Now, in the likes of um, uh, Dragon Capital and Vina Capital, which is a domestic investment manager, they do have their own onshore domestic funds in, the, in, in terms of say Vietnamese Dong denomination. But again, those are only for Vietnamese investors, and that is it. No foreign investor would go into that. They always go into their offshore Cayman vehicles. Uh, what do you think about the future of uh, fund in, in Vietnam? What would change something uh, you know, in, in the near future? Uh, <laughs> I can tell you now, it's a regulatory. It's like, OK, the best way to describe it, it's like Singapore. Singapore launched the VCC in January of 2020. Why didn't they launch this back in 1980s? You get what I'm saying? So it takes a lot of time and a lot, it's, it's not just saying, hey, let's do fund structures. You've got to do le legislation changes in the laws to be able to pr provide such a structure. Now, and again, the other thing you need to consider is foreign capital, you know? Vietnam is, an, is a foreign exchange control um, jurisdiction, where Singapore and Hong Kong, Cayman, Luxembourg, Ireland are not. So again, you can't just go and say, hey, I'm going to wire US dollar to Vietnam and get it out without, without any problems. No, it doesn't work that way. Again, those, those are what we call legislation changes for it to happen. So it's just, it, th these things just can't happen overnight. They do take a lot of time. And they also need to be approved by the government. I see. Um, from, from your perspective, uh, just the, the last one, uh, do you think it's on the right way in terms of, uh, you know, the, the regulation uh, funds regulation in Vietnam? Is that on the right track or is there anything that can change? Oh, yeah, it can definitely change. And I can tell you now one of the funds that I do have, and Liam knows of this one, we have a private equity investment in Vietnam, okay, which is meant to IPO, but it looks like it's not going to IPO because of COVID. Um, 
And unfortunately, when we decide to try, um, well, in this case, not liquidate, but try to transfer the underlying investment, uh, your securities regulator in Vietnam actually stopped us. They didn't allow us to transfer it because they said there were some legislative changes happening. And this actually occurred at the beginning of this year. So we weren't actually allowed to, to change the ownership of our holdings in a private company in Vietnam. But again, that was not of our control. It was on the control of the, of the securities regulator in Vietnam. But now that's changed. So what we learned today was that the process and actually our broker in Vietnam was saying, yes, it is now open. That's all good. But, and if you do do this, you would be the very first one under the new laws to change the ownership. And it's like, hold it a minute. How can we, we be, the, but it is, as I said, we're not the first ones to do it, but it's the first ones to do it under the new legislation that they've passed. So it's, it's again, legislation and laws, stability. Uh, you know, this caught us off guard at the beginning of the year because we wanted to liquidate that or transfer that position across. But because of COVID, the government stopped us. I see. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of things to, to change and it should be more stable, I think. Uh, Correct. And open. And this is where, you know, if this were a Singapore company, we, we wouldn't have such a problem. I see. I see. Understand. Uh, thanks, Anthony. Uh, yeah, well, for, for uh, Liam, please. Um, we, we all heard of and understand that um, Ireland prepare very much for uh, the Brexit. Okay, in terms of funds, I believe that is uh, will be more, you know, like uh, even for us, uh, we, we got some investment in in uh, uh, London and you know like uh, on across uh, in, in the UK. So what what do you think after that? What is the, the chance, the opportunity for you know like um, Irish fund admin or something? You know everything related to to that situation. Yeah, I I think Brexit is, is well. Brexit is still evolving. Um, you know I. Uh, if we go back a month, you probably saw stories in the UK that there were challenges to get petrol and petrol stations. And, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I think the challenges that Brexit is presenting to the UK are only starting to, to, um, to be seen now. Um, and it, it's, they're not going to go away. So it certainly presents opportunities for, you know, for other jurisdictions not just Ireland but you know within the EU you know Ireland is we're in a very lucky position in the European Union in that we are the only English speaking country in the EU um you know where English is our first language um we we always were only the the only English speaking uh country in the eurozone you know because the UK when they were in the EU they had still kept with sterling um and you know we also from a geographical perspective where you know if you take a plane from America the first country you hit when you come to Europe is is Ireland um and we also have um we have US pre-clearance we're one of I think two countries in the world I think ourselves Bermuda and maybe Sweden we're three countries that have um US pre-clearance domestically in our airports um which gives us much quicker access into the states um you know so i think ireland is very well placed strategically um the, the challenge and you know the investment limited partnership act so you know when anthony talks about you know the, the time for legend you know legislative changes the the irish limited partnership act that was enacted last year the previous limited partnership act i think was 1907 you know, so it's, it's, you know, I'm not saying it's taken over, you know, a hundred plus years to change it, but, you know, these things take time. Um, ultimately, you know, Ireland has, we've done very well being in Europe. We've also done very well because we, we have, we traditionally have had a low corporate tax rate. We've just agreed to raise that from 12 and a half percent to 15%, um, along with some other countries with similar rates. Um, I think the biggest challenge Ireland has really is housing, you know, in Dublin city, um, the price, you know, the housing market is very constrained. Uh, COVID didn't help that. Um, and we don't build hot, we don't build, build tall, you know, so housing, as you probably would have seen Tien and Anthony would know, you know, housing just is spread further and further out. Most Irish people want to own houses and they don't want to rent or own apartments and um, so that needs to change to facilitate further growth it's kind of interesting you know when, when you were the, the questions you asked anthony there um as you were talking i just i was trying to remind remember the name of that building in, in saigon 
that I've sat in, you know, in the viewing deck. I, I thought it was the tallest building, the, the Pitexo Tower. Pitex, it's actually now the yeah. yeah, it's now the fourth tallest building in in, in Vietnam. Um, you know, and it, I always remember I've been there up that up there a couple of times, and you know, you get the great view over the um, the, the the river, um, the Saigon River, and the um, you can see all the development that's growing. I've been to Hoi An, you see all the development that's there. So, you know, I, I think Vietnam is very well poised. You can see the real estate growth is there. I've made, rightly or wrongly, I've often assumed that that growth is probably uh, held or supported through real estate funds. I, I could be wrong, I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, I, I think Vietnam is, it's moving in the right direction. It certainly is moving in the right direction, um, you know, um, and it's, you know, which is probably very different to Ireland. I think the challenges we have are probably um, structural in, in nature. Um, you know, I think we have got the the workforce, we have got the tax advantages, we we do have the the reputation as being um, a very uh, uh, a very good jurisdiction, to, you know, to work with or to base fund structures from. So I think our our bigger challenge is probably on more on the macro level, where we need our governments to actually to, to think long term. And you know to, to help develop the infrastructure, not just in Dublin but across the, the whole island, to facilitate further growth. I see. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Liam. And um, yeah, I think it's uh, maybe the time for the um, audiences to get involved. Uh, any of you want to, you know, um, ask our speaker here, Anthony and Liam? Please just throw a question. Hi, Ian. Um, it's Ruel here. Sorry. Um, my question um, is probably about the structuring. Um, okay. Uh, can can we I... see you, Ruel? Okay. Sure. Go ahead. I'm just yeah. turning on my video. Yeah, it should be more interactive. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so actually, while uh, Liam and Anthony were talking about um, Delaware, um, Cayman Island and Ireland. What struck my mind is actually Facebook, which is now known as Meta, right? Uh, but um, relating it to a fund management setup, we're going to operate here. So I just wonder, because um, Ireland, if I'm not mistaken, there's a corporate tax rate of 12.5%, uh, but whereas Cayman is zero. So uh, what, what really stand out among the three, the uh, the three among Ireland, Cayman, Bermuda, uh, what, what really stand out if you're gonna behaving your management team here in Vietnam? What, 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 what the holding company offshore would be ideal and why not uh, the good old British Virgin Island? Yeah, I'll, I'll, exp I'll explain to you the difference between the three jurisdictions, okay? So Bermuda, Cayman, BVI are all British territories, okay, under British common law, okay? Um, and I'll give you a bit of a history background. The original Companies Act, Mutual Funds Act or Investment Funds Act was originally written in Bermuda, which was then copied a few years later by both Cayman and BVI, okay? Now, there's actually between the three jurisdictions that you just mentioned, there's actually no difference or very little difference between the three of them. Now, the reason we, we don't, or well, we haven't discussed BVI here is for a fund structure, it is used as a fund domicile, but typically BVI is being used as a trust structure uh, domicile, okay? Now, Liam brought up a very, very good comment. Bermuda started and then came and overtook Bermuda many, a few, quite a few years ago, okay, when this occurred. It's not that Bermuda stopped doing funds, they still do funds, but what they did was they re domicile or refocused their industry to reinsurance and insurance. Okay. Bermuda as a jurisdiction is uh, the, the largest jurisdiction for insurance reinsurance in the world. Okay. It's not saying that he just said, oh, well, we're going to stop doing funds. We're just focusing. No, they, they still do funds, but they just refocus their, their uh, island industry to do insurance. And just to give you an example, insurance reinsurance industry is actually three times bigger than the funds industry. So per capita as an island, both Cayman and Bermuda have a population of about 70,000 people, but per capita, Bermuda is significantly richer in terms of per capita wealth. Um, 
but that's because they focused on an industry that was much larger than the funds industry. BVI is nothing against BVI. They've been fine. They've been around, but they're certainly um, used more for trusts. And you can certainly use BVI as a, as a domicile. Um, the best way I describe it, and Lee, you could probably disagree, or disagree with me. Um, Cayman is like Luxembourg because Luxembourg by number of funds has got more funds in the EU than, 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 uh, than most of the other jurisdictions. Bermuda is like uh, Ireland and BVI is the equivalent of Malta. So Luxembourg, Ireland, Malta are all EU jurisdictions under and supervised under ESMA, but it's just based on the number of funds. That's all it is. Okay, Liam, do you wanna kind of add to that? Yeah, no, I, I think Raul, it's a it's a good point. You know, BVI, we 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 service BVI funds. Um, I I think, uh, you know, from from my perspective, you know, the the clients that I would see that have BVI, you know, their their focus is, you know, they want to set up a BVI incubator fund, so keep their costs down. They're not exposed to audit, so their costs can be significantly lower while still in the fund structure, but they're very much their short to medium term plan is to grow the assets prove their track record and then re-domicile to Cayman, to Ireland, to Luxembourg when their assets grow. Um, and I, I think a lot of that is probably down to the institutional investors, the pension funds, the, you know, they probably have less of an appetite to BVI as they would to more, towards the more regulated jurisdictions um, that, that, that exist there. Yeah, and just to, to quick... Yeah, just quickly add to that too. A good, another good, interesting example is if you wanted to say, for, if you're looking at listing on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, mm -hmm. okay, most of the companies that list on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, yes, there's Hong Kong companies, but most mm -hmm. of them are actually Bermuda and Cayman companies, not BVI companies. Okay, but in terms of compliance, costs, maintaining one, um, tax, uh, bearing in mind that we're here in Vietnam, and then the offshore company will be somewhere in Cayman or BVI. So there are pretty much not much difference. There's right? much. Okay. The, the difference you'll see is primarily, I call it the little nuances, okay? For example, if you run a Cayman fund, you need to have a Cayman auditor sign off, okay, which increases mm -hmm. a little bit more. You need yeah. to appoint an AML, COML, RO anti-money compliance officer, money laundering reporting officer. In, in Bermuda, you don't need that. And same as, as Liam mentioned, BVI, you don't need to have an audit. You can actually exempt yourself from audit. So these are what we call the little nuances, okay? Mm -hmm. Or what I call, but the structure, the regulation, um, apart from these little nuances are pretty much identical between the three of them. All right, got it. Um, I have another question. Um, it, it's actually for Anthony. Anthony, you mentioned earlier about management shares. So I just kind of wondering what exactly management shares in your right. world. Yeah. So management shares is just a, another name for calling common shares. So common shares are what we call okay. voting shares. Okay. We just call it management shares because it's the shares that manage the company. Okay. So when I say manage the company, it has the voting rights to appoint and resign directors on the fund company, okay? Where investors are not given those shares, they're given preferential shares. And preferential shares in the meeting are participating only, um, non-voting, so they only participate, but then they have the right to redeem. Got it, okay, cool. Thank you. That's all from me. Thank you very much, Liam and Anthony. Okay. Thanks, Provo. Okay, uh, we got more question. Anyone else want to raise more question? One, two, three. Okay, so we got one question from uh, the uh, audience outside of uh, this group, which is uh, the question is that uh, how are uh, digital or uh, crypto funds different from the fiat ones and in terms of investing and managing? If you got any ideas in terms of those, you know, digital or crypto funds. I'll let you go, Liam. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a really good question. Um, and I, I think the, you know, depending on what data you look at, you know, 
cryptocurrencies and you know the growth we're going to see of those in the coming years is going to be significant and it's the challenge that we've seen and you know if i go back to 2017 you know late 2017 i started having these conversations um can you still hear me i think i'm getting them yep. you know sorry i'm yep. getting the, an error message here yeah if you go back to 2017 when bitcoin was starting to rocket up um the challenge we had you know we had plenty of opportunities for potential clients to launch crypto funds the challenge that we had was to get bank accounts to open for them um that was one challenge and it probably still is a challenge um but there are solutions um and i think another challenge would have been for a lot of fund structures um investors wanted to do what's called an in specie subscription so not subscribe in cash in a fiat currency but to subscribe in bitcoin um and the challenge there is as an administrator is to prove the source of funds you know because when money comes into a bank account you can see the the transfer the tt details from whom it came it's more challenging for crypto um so i think you know so i think they were the initial challenges as i sit today in europe i think the the appetite of the regulators here to um to consider cryptos is probably not as warm as regulators in came in bermuda and in asia um so we're you know we're certainly seeing europe is slower to move my own thoughts really are that what's going to move and you know what will jolt the regulators into action is when the largest fund houses you know the black rocks or whomever when they you know go to the regulators and say look we're going to be putting 10 percent allocating 10 percent of of dry powder to crypto you know that will really you know drive the um the um the growth of crypto within fund structures um but you know it's there are fun, crypto funds out there. There are administrators that specialize in them. There are great auto firms that specialize in them. Um, but, you know, we're still seeing like crypto exchanges are still evolving, although some are now listed entities. Um, it's a really exciting space. And, you know, it's, I remember back in 2017 thinking to myself, you know, there, there's probably a great opportunity to set up as a crypto fund administrator, do nothing but crypto fund admin. Um, I wasn't brave enough to do it then, um, but you know it's it, it's very much an exciting place now, and I think we will see them become more mainstream. Um, but once again, I think the banking challenge hasn't gone away, the regulatory appetite in some jurisdictions hasn't gone away. Um, but you know, with with Bitcoin and other currencies shooting up again this year and in recent months, you know, I think that you know these opportunities are starting to present themselves more and more. I think Anthony, you have do you have some clients or potential clients in these asset classes um so you've probably an even better idea of you know of challenges yeah. and pitfalls yeah and liam touched on it um the, the the word crypto is a taboo to banks uh to to regulators uh in in particular uh fataf which is the financial action task force which is the the global governing body that um regulates anti-money laundering the, the big issue with crypto in the early days is that it was just you could you could buy crypto without having your assets checked or where where was your source of funding coming from um and you know it was used by and i i'll say this very bluntly but used by inconspicuous people drug dealers money launderers that type of thing as a way to get their money into the financial network um to try and make it look clean because uh, there was no checks and balances. But as Liam said, over the years, things have changed. Uh, and there, a lot of the service providers who are dealing in that crypto space are becoming, either, you know, the jurisdictions are regulating them. Um, and actually, again, it's, it's just one of those things. Once more regulation comes in, the better it's going to be and the more it'll be accepted. But for the time being that, like, like with new legislation, it just takes time. I see. Yeah, uh, I, I think that uh, it's a, um, a couple of things that we, we need to wait to see and uh, is we change. Uh, and I do hope that uh, within the cup, um, couple of months or even years, we can sit down again and continue this conversation. And uh, this will be a new perspective sometime. And uh, after this program, I believe that uh, there will be more people that uh, want to involve in uh, in 
you know, like uh, building a fund, as we see that the the, the effectiveness of um, of the fund compared to you know corporate and many things else. And uh, at that point of time, I believe that uh, you can reach out to Anthony and Liam to uh, get more, uh, you know, like advice and also um, understand more uh, deeply and you know advance. Uh, okay, so our section today is uh, come to an end. And uh, thanks very much, Anthony and Liam. And we hope that we can get involved in you know uh, some kind uh, new uh, topics very soon uh, in the future okay Tian thank you for organizing and thanks to everyone and look if you have any questions just reach out Tian Tian will pass our details and Liam good chatting with you again yeah likewise yeah. I now know what ink I now know what inku stands for <laughs> <laughs> you, didn't, you, did, you didn't know that after so I, many I, years no i i assumed inku was something to do with you know the the incas or central america or no. something or the greek gods <laughs> it's just cutting incubation and just for the first four go. letters yeah there you go <laughs> it's just more or less like uh, you know incubation they, in in the vc where is quite common and correct yeah exactly yeah, i see yeah okay, okay. okay. thanks guy thanks thank, very much, you, thank you have a great day Bye-bye. Good, good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.